makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London with the conversations that matter, and here's what's coming up on today's program. OpenAI says it's holding intense discussions to quell a potential staff mutiny over its ousted leader, Sam Altman. Meanwhile, Microsoft's chief executive tells Bloomberg he wants to partner with Altman wherever he is. We definitely will want some governance changes so that, you know, you know, you know surprises are bad and uh, we just want to make sure that things are done in a way that will allow us to con continue to partner well. That's about it. Now, City cuts more than 300 senior manager roles, part of Chief Executive Jane Fraser's efforts to simplify the Wall Street giants. Plus, the Germany's budget crisis deepens as the finance ministry imposes an emergency spending freeze in response to last week's ruling by the country's top court. So welcome, everyone. A lot of news we have to cover today. Let's take a look at the European markets map. Now, again, a lot of the focus will be on Fed minutes, uh, on what we will hear from a lot of central banks out there and what that means for the market rally. Now, emerging market stocks and currencies seem to be extending a lot of the gains. Again, the dollar's weakening. Uh, Treasury yields are falling. A strong surge on Wall Street uh, seems to be spurring demand for risk assets. If you look at some of the U.S. equity futures, they're pretty much a little change, and some of the other things that we're looking at, of course, is artificial intelligence, um, with investors still trying to return co-founder Sam Altman to a leadership role at ChatGPT. Now, Bloomberg has seen a memo sent to OpenAI staff that says the company is in, quote, intense discussions to unify its divided staff. Now, we also understand that investors are still trying to return Altman to this leadership role at the ChatGPT maker. So let's get more on all of this from Bloomberg's Alex Webb. Alex, what a story. I mean, I kind of, it's a whirlwind. There's a mutiny. There are, some, there are two factions. There could be more worrying factions. What are the odds of Altman actually returning to OpenAI? It's looking pretty probable right now that, that at least there'll be some sort of coalescence between OpenAI and Microsoft with, with Sam Altman having an influence. You know, this letter is pretty remarkable, really, that uh, OpenAI has something like 770 employees. More than 740 of them have apparently signed this letter in support of Altman and, and criticizing the board. You meanwhile got uh, the reporting that there is work to kind of, well, there's a letter as well from the board itself saying they're working to unify the company. It seems as though everybody's pushing in that similar direction. Even Ilya Sutskeva, who was the chief scientist, one of the board members who had voted uh, Altman out, he is now backtracked and said he made a mistake. He should not have done that. So it all looks to go in that direction. But so, Alex, I thought this was about, you know, so some of the, the, I don't know whether it's virtue signaling, but it's regulation, it's basically ethics. What was the battle really about? Well, we don't know the full details, but one of the, if, it's really worth reading, uh, the big take, Bloomberg big take from yesterday by our colleagues Max Chafkin and Rachel Metz, it is to do with AI safety. And a lot of these board members are quite closely aligned with the effective altruism movement. The effective altruism movement, of course, is also what Sam Bankman-Fried was a member of, they, or an adherent to, I should say, where the belief is essentially that you can make a huge amount of money and use those proceeds to help the world. And with OpenAI, part of the mission was actually if we were going to develop AI in a way that is safe for the world, and that was why originally it was open and not closely aligned with the company. It looks as though there's a little bit of concern about whether it is still sticking to those values, at least from the four of the six members who voted him out. So, Alex, what happens to him, actually, if he, if he doesn't go back to um, you know, ch the chat GPT maker, and when do we find out what happens? So he, he's signed on to become head of advanced research, or head of an advanced research team, I should say at Microsoft uh, the expectation is that if he if that role proceeds as at the moment it's set to do he will pot potentially take a lot of the talent from open AI with him a lot of them have expressed their support as we said that is the big concern for open AI because for all of the concern about do you have enough software capabilities or sorry hardware capabilities in terms of servers AI is about talent it's about the people who can do it it's a relatively limited pool of talent these big AI minds are relatively few and far between. Microsoft did not have a sizable um, AI research unit that is comparable to what Google has with DeepMind. It kind of got that with OpenAI. It's in a really a win-win situation. A little bit of complication around the edges in terms of timing, how quickly it could catch up. But if they, if 
Altman stays at Microsoft or goes to Microsoft and he brings even 100 researchers with him from OpenAI. That puts Microsoft in a relatively strong place. Alex, thanks so much for all of the updates. Alex Webb there from our tech team. Now, we'll also have more from our interview with the Microsoft chief executive a little bit later this hour. Now, back to the markets. Treasuries moved higher after an option of a 20-year debt went ahead without a hitch. The Treasury term premium turned negative as investors, though, grew skeptical that the Fed will be able to engineer a soft landing. Well, uh, joining us to dive into the markets is Vasiliki Pachaturidi, head of EMEA iShares Fixed Income Strategy at BlackRock. Vasiliki, thank you for joining us. There's a lot going on in the fixed income space. It's like, hold on to your horses. What do you see the, the biggest trend over the next couple of weeks? Sure. I think you, 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 you captured it very well. The market is really desperate to lean into this soft landing narrative. They see inflation slowing, uh, going down and growth obviously not uh, hitting down the road. But we're not leaning into this story. Uh, we, we think that central banks, the Fed, will keep rates higher for, for longer. Um, we think that, you know, we do believe that inflation will get down to 2%, which is the Fed's target by mid of next year. Mm -hmm. But we are in this new regime, and we've been talking about that a lot. Inflation uncertainty will be high. Bond market volatility will be high. Investors will be demanding more compensation for, long, for holding longer-term bonds. But what I want to emphasize today, and you talked about the next couple of weeks, is that this challenging mark marker environment doesn't mean that opportunities do not exist. Right. Uh, we've seen... So where do you see them? I mean, this where, is, it's, we... it's difficult, right? Because also the market seems to be pricing one thing, which ha has been so far a bit of a recession or a slowdown, and actually data surprise to the upside. Absolutely. I mean, the last couple of weeks, if I look at bond ETF data, we see uh, investors starting to put cash to work, which is a very big shift to what we've seen, the defensive positioning that we've seen so far this year. So just in the first two weeks of November, we've seen uh, a rise uh, in high yield ETF flows. In fact, high yield ETFs globally have got more than 10 billion in, a, uh, in, in net new assets and investment grade credit. What does that mean? I think investors probably are better Adding on the U.S. economy strength, uh, yeah. staying a bit yeah. stronger for a little yeah. longer. But they're also, they seem to be, you know, something that you're pushing back against, like pricing and Fed cuts. Mm -hmm. Is that wishful I thinking from, the, from markets? I, I think at this stage, they really try to lean on this they soft. Want, they want <laughs> they, the cuts. They, they really want the cuts. And I think that could be a headwind for, for bonds, for the asset class coming into the next year. And I also think the central bankers, they clearly don't want yields to drop uh, before they fight in, in inflation. So I think that could be a poten potential headwind. Uh, but again, going back to, to our earlier point, opportunities do exist. The fact that the macro environment, it is challenging, doesn't mean you should sit in cash. But when's the right, what, you know, when's the right time actually to come in? Is there an opportunity? Is it, you know, before the end of the year, or is there a signal that you're waiting for to say, look, this is the right time for you to enter the market? Yeah, I think we have to look at it from two angles. Um, I think right now is perhaps a good time to start thinking about rebuilding your strategic asset allocation. Mm -hmm. Speaking to our European clients, we know that they're probably the most underweight they've mm -hmm. been mm -hmm. in European fixed income. This is an overhang from the previous cycle where rates have been so negative in. Europe. So it is a good time to start thinking about how do I rebuild my core allocation going into next year. And then the other angle is that, you know, in this environment, you have to be more tactical. You have to be more nimble. Well, uh, we do see a rise in dispersion if we think about spread assets, of course. So you have to be selective. Yeah. And again, the flows that we've seen recently yeah. indicate that investors are ready to start deploying marginal cash and finding those tactical opportunities. But it is about rebuilding the core of portfolios and stepping in for where opportunities are. So, Vasiliki, how do you view this? Again, is it, for example, on sector-wise? And so you look at some of the you know, ETFs on, on you know, some of the main trends that yeah. we're seeing or that we will see in 2024, you do break it down regionally. Yeah, I think the obvious opportunity is income right now. Okay. Stable income, quality income, as we go past uh, the peak in rates. And that's why we see demand for quality ETFs, ETFs with a fixed maturity. I think investors 
is like that pull to par effect. Mm -hmm. Another way to add risk in your portfolio is through extending duration and I think there we're very selective. We prefer to hold longer duration in Europe because more of the economic damage is priced in uh, and also they don't have some of those headwinds in the US with a fiscal budget uh, and QT. Uh, but again, just selectivity when it comes to duration and then with spread assets I think that's your opportunity to really look through the regions, through the sectors, through credit quality buckets. Again, if I speak to the, my, my clients, they have a preference for high yield in the US than, than in Europe, but in Europe there's a quality bias. What do you do with the UK? What we do with the UK, <laughs> exactly. I think my observation on the UK is the fact that um, there is very low confidence, there is very low interest from yep. foreign investors. Valuations are attractive, but you know, I think we need to see more foreign interest coming into this market. But yeah, we would be comfortable owning duration. I mean, and I mean, you make a very good point, which we try and cover certainly in our weekly show, also Bloomberg UK. Is there going to be a catalyst for investment coming back in? I don't know whether it's worry about a change in policy or just some of the uncertainty surrounding this government. Like, how do you, you know, yeah. when do you play the UK with more conviction? It's a great question. It's a golden question. I think it's for international investors also it's a relative play. They have to assess, you know, where the opportunities, where they are. FX is, is another important consideration. But I know we have uh, news coming up later, later this week and politics and, and policy matters a lot. Anything in Asia that you're looking out for? Again, so we try and, and also look at the FDI investments in China yeah. uh, that have been, I think, turned negative for the, for the first time since they've been recorded and the impact this has elsewhere. What does it mean for your I strategy? I would say more broadly emerging markets, fixed income, emerging market debt, not specifically in Asia, but I would say as a, as a, as a whole, asset, yeah. uh, as an asset class, is something that we're watching. Uh, I think it is an asset class that investors have not probably yeah. looked at in many, many, uh, many years. So valuations are attractive, but I also think the macro context for a lot of the emerging markets is more favorable versus DM. Uh, what we're missing obviously is the flows mm -hmm. and obviously a weaker dollar could mm -hmm. be supportive for emerging market debt. Vasiliki, thank you so much for joining us today. Vasiliki Pacha Turidi, head of EMEA iShares Fixed Income Strategy at BlackRock. Now coming up, hundreds of job cuts at Citigroup, but will they be enough to turn its stock price around? We discuss that next. This is Bloomberg. November 22nd, Chancellor of the Exchequer Jeremy Hunt delivers the UK's autumn statement. Will he deliver tax cuts? What is his plan to grow the economy? Can he set up the Conservative Party for a win next election? Live from the Houses of Parliament, Bloomberg Television brings you up to the minute news and analysis. Special coverage begins Wednesday with Hunt's remarks starting at 12.30 p.m. London time. Bloomberg, context changes everything. Now, the conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is a Paul Sumfront Sinlacqua here in London. So hundreds of senior managers and several senior traders are leaving Citigroup as part of the bank's biggest restructuring in two decades. The chief executive, Jane Fraser, announced plans last month to get rid of five layers of management. Now, there's also change at the top of Philip Fidelity, with the chief executive, Ann Richards, stepping down unexpectedly after five years. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Bloomberg's breaking news editor, Leo Kencherper. Leo, Thank you for joining us. So what do we actually know about the job losses at City? Exactly. So first of all, as you said, it's all part of the bigger uh, revamp announced by Jane Fraser in September. Um, the biggest revamp in two decades, actually. And uh, City is uh, the main thing is actually City mm -hmm. is getting rid of two um, of the two. Uh, core operating units and is focusing on five key businesses instead. And this is, you know, um, I think in line with uh, Wall Street peers. Uh, on Monday, it came through that uh, uh, 300 senior managers are leaving City and they sit um, two levels below Jane Fraser's executive management. And there were also news that um, uh, some key traders are leaving as well, uh, among them the uh, head of equities trading in Europe. And um, I think the bad news for city staff is that those cuts are not over yet. Uh, city will announce 
fresh cuts um, early next year and then hopes to complete the process um, yeah. by, by the end of the first quarter. I mean, this is a pr very big overhaul. So, w you know, what kind of impact will it have? Exactly. Um, so shares are up since the announcement, about 9%. I just mm -hmm. checked on that. And um, the other effect I see is that restructuring, of course, isn't cheap. Um, there will be um, some hefty severance charges as part of these job cuts. And um, then I think after that, going forward, execution is really key. Um, one key figure to watch is return on equity. I just had a look. Um, City still has the lowest return on equity of all major Wall Street banks. So that's a key figure to watch next year. Uh, do we know uh, what Fidelity does after Ann Richards departed? Oh, yes. Um, Fidelity, uh, so first of all, Fidelity International um, is, the, uh, is the arm of, of Fidelity outside the U.S. And there was a surprise, um, surprise announcement um, yesterday that uh, she will be leaving. And I think, so communication could have been a bit smoother there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, given they are owned by management and the founding family, um, I think they're, uh, and, and, you know, given their, their assets doubled, uh, yeah. since, since 2018, I think they're looking in pretty decent shape, yeah. so not too much to worry here, uh, for, in my view. Leo, thank you so much. Uh, Leonard Ketchemper there with the very latest on some of the financial services. Now let's get to some of the other top red stories on the Bloomberg terminal. TSMC is said to be considering building a third plant in Japan that would make advanced three nanometer chips. Now the move could potentially turn the nation into a major global chip making hub. TSMC is already in the process of building one fab or one lab, I think, in Japan for less advanced chips and plans to for a second facility have been reported earlier. Now, Bloomberg has learned that software maker C3 AI has slashed to jobs, citing employee performance and the need to cut costs. In a statement, C3 AI says it regularly manages out lower performance employees and that it has over uh, 100 open positions. And the U.S. Justice Department is seeking more than $4 billion from the cryptocurrency exchange Binance to sell its investigation into alleged money laundering, bank fraud and sanctions violations. Now, Bloomberg understands the Binance founder, Shangpen Zhao, or CZ as we call him, could face criminal charges under the agreement, while CZ denies the allegations. Far-right populist Geert Wilders has jumped to third place in the latest survey ahead of elections on Wednesday, setting the stage for him to enter government. Now, according to polls yesterday, his Freedom Party is projected to gain 26 seats in Parliament, just one seat less than two parties currently tied for first place. All right, coming up, Hamas's chief says the group is close to a truce agreement in talks with Qatar and Israel, reviving hopes of progress over hostages. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. The conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the chief of Hamas says his group is close to reaching a truce agreement in talks with Qatar and Israel, suggesting progress in the hostage talks. Joining us now for more is Bloomberg's Paul Wallace in Dubai. So, Paul, how close is the deal? Hi, Francine. Well, that is the big question. This is the first time Hamas and its leader have said that they are close to an agreement uh, with Israel. Uh, these are not direct talks. They're being mediated via Qatar. And um, it seems as if there's a good chance we get a large group of, of hostages that are being held by Hamas uh, in, in Gaza released in, in the coming days. I should note that these talks could definitely still break down, and we still haven't heard a response response from the Israeli government to um, Hamas's latest proposals. We're not exactly sure what um, the latest um, sort of um, t uh, t uh, negoti n negotiation point was from Hamas. But broadly speaking, uh, it seems as if we'll get a group of about 50 or maybe even 100 hostages released, probably mainly women and children. And in return, Israel will agree to some kind of partial uh, truce, maybe uh, limited for a few hours a day and not to all of Gaza, but to parts of it. And also, it would probably agree to release some Palestinians held in Israeli jails. So, Paul, what would the deal mean for a ceasefire in Gaza? 
Again, that's a big question. Israel has been very consistent that it doesn't want uh, to accept a ceasefire yet. It thinks that would just play into Hamas's hands and allow the militant group to um, uh, to, to regroup and uh, to regain some of its uh, strength. So it seems as if fighting would still be going on even if there were uh, truces each day for, for a short amount of time and even if they included um, uh, a, 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 a sort of a limited um, pause in Israeli airstrikes or a part of the territory. But it, as far as Israel is concerned and as far as uh, Israel is saying publicly, this war is continuing until Hamas is, is destroyed and that's not going to change um, even if a large group of hostages is released from, from Gaza. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Paul Wallace there on the very latest in the Middle East. Now coming up, the Microsoft Chief Executive Officer Satya Nadella says he isn't against Sam Altman's return to open AI. Now we take a closer look at how the boardroom saga will affect the AI arms race. That's coming up next. In the meantime, this is what the markets are looking at. A lot of the focus, of course, is on the dollar's decline. This is spurring an emerging markets rally. If you look at the dollar uh, declining, it's really amid a growing wager on a rapid Fed pivot to rate cuts in 2024. This is Bloomberg. OpenAI says it's holding intense discussions to quell a potential staff mutiny over its ousted leader, Sam Altman. City cuts more than 300 senior manager roles, part of Chief Executive Jane Fraser's efforts to simplify the Wall Street giants. Plus, Germany's budget crisis deepens as the finance ministry now imposes an emergency spending freeze in response to last week's ruling by the country's top court. Now, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. So the Microsoft chief executive, Satya Nadella, has told Bloomberg that he would not object to Sam Altman going back to OpenAI. Now, he says Microsoft is committed to working with him wherever he is. We are leading in this next generation of AI technology. Uh, we continue to be committed to OpenAI, and we continue to be co committed to Sam and Greg and the team, uh, irrespective of where they are. And, you know, I, I think about Sam has chosen multiple times now to work with us, and that's fantastic to see. And I think the real thing is that the capability that Microsoft has across the tech stack is what attracts uh, great people like Sam, you know, and people like Sam and, you know, innovators like Sam when it comes to AI to come to us, and we are thrilled about it. You incredibly quickly hired Sam as well as Greg. We are uh, hearing that Sam wants to return. Investors want him to return to OpenAI. How would you feel about that? Yeah, as I said, we really are, want to partner with OpenAI and we want to partner with Sam. And so irrespective of where Sam is, He's working with Microsoft, and that is the case on Friday, and that'll be that's the case today, and we will, I absolutely believe that that'll be the case tomorrow. So what are the conversations you've had uh, with OpenAI's current board? From their perspective, where do things stand? And have you talked with Emmett Shear, the new interim CEO? Yeah, I've had conversations with Emmett, and again, it's the same thing. There's no real difference that from where we were when we were working with Mira and she was interim CEO when Sam was CEO uh, and Emmett. So my message to them, Emmett is very clear, which is, hey, look, we remain very, very committed to OpenAI and its mission and its sort of roadmap, and they can count on us. And, and then, as I said, we are also very committed to Sam and Greg and team that want to join us. Uh, if they're not at OpenAI or anyone else who is at OpenAI wants to go somewhere else, we want them to come to Microsoft and continue to work uh, here and in partnership with OpenAI. To your knowledge, why was Sam fired? And to your knowledge, was he involved in any wrongdoing? Has the board given you a reason? Not, yeah, I, as far as I'm concerned, you know, we were, as I said, we were very confident in Sam and his leadership team. I've not been told about anything. I, you know, they published internally at OpenAI that 
Uh, there is not, the, the board has not talked about anything that Sam did other than some breakdown in communications. And I, you know, I'm not directly, and was told by anyone from their board about any issues. And so therefore I remain confident in Sam and his leadership uh, and capability. And that's why, you know, we want to welcome him to Microsoft. Now, we understand that to support a, a return of Sam Altman to OpenAI, Microsoft wants some changes to the board, to governance, to its overall contract with OpenAI, so something like this never happens again. What specifically are you looking for? For example, would you want a board seat? And if not, what else? Yeah, I mean, I think we definitely will want some governance changes. So, that, you know, you know, surprises are bad. and. Uh, we just want to make sure that things are done in a way that will allow us to con continue to partner well. That's about it, right? You know, this idea that somehow, you know, suddenly changes happen without being, you know, in the loop is not good. Uh, and uh, we will definitely ensure that some of the changes that are needed happen. And, and we continue to be able to go along on the partnership with uh, OpenAI. Well, that was the Microsoft Chief Executive Officer Satya Nadella speaking with Bloomberg's Emily Chang. So what does this boardroom saga actually mean for the future of AI? Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's Mark Bergen and Matt Bloxham from Bloomberg Intelligence. A little bit obsessed with this story because it mm -hmm. kind of came out of the blue. Okay. Right, Matt? We weren't really expecting it. And it's, I mean, it's juicy because we don't really know what's happened. There are two warring factions, if not three or four, and we're not 100% sure what it's about. No, we're not. It's almost like it's a Netflix drama in the making, isn't it, in a year or two's time. And I guess boardroom coups are not that un unusual. But, yeah, the speed with which this has happened uh, and the, the consequences it's created, you know, with 500 or so people uh, at OpenAI saying they're going to leave too, it's just uh, incredible. So this back and forth, I it feels like there's at least a few more twists in the, in the story to come. Yeah, for sure. And I wonder, Mark, how much, how much does this have to do with ethics? Or how much is it, you know, actually c commercial deals in the background? Uh, I think it's very clear in part because the board that made this decision, and this was at this point, I think, three outside board members, and then the chief scientist at, at OpenAI who's since rescinded and kind of uh, signed a letter. Um, but the, the statement they put out was very thin on details, and they haven't, as far as my knowledge, haven't spoken at all. Um, from former reporting, it's, there is some concerns about there's a camp that believes strongly in AI safety and the harms, and that there is this existential risk that's technical technology poses and that the path that Altman was taking the company of like moving it down the um, too quickly on commercialization may have been a concern. Uh, but again, we have there seems to be so much reporting. There's not the substantial about about what the rift is. Yeah. Matt, what, what have you been hearing? I mean, how, how much is this true? I mean, again, Microsoft. And it's amazing to hear Satya Nadella saying, like, you know, we're committed to him. We trust him almost no matter what. Is that because they have 10 billion tied into open AI or is it, you know, the personality that that we think is is appealing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's both things. And I think, you know, that, um, this kind of complex structure at open AI of having a nonprofit with a profit within it and these commercial tensions. Yeah, we, we've read that, you know, the the pace of growth uh, in users and, and managing the cost of that was kind of quite a big challenge. So you had some very kind of divergent views, I think, within that organization that's created that tension. I have to say, I think Microsoft have played this incredibly well. They're being, being very pragmatic. They move incredibly quickly it kind of seems either way they're going to be a, a, a winner because they've either got the kind of the crown jewels if you like in, in that team working within Microsoft or they've reinserted them back into an open AI where they've got more control and influence because that was always a weakness uh, in the structure that, that they had in the first place. But Matt I mean the fact that there's also a possible mutiny with people saying look mm -hmm. we'll leave if he doesn't come back is it a testament to how some of these companies work or is it actually a testament to his character and how he's led the company? I, I mean, I don't know for sure, but it kind of feels to me it's more, more the latter, that you know, yeah. he is uh, uh, an incredibly uh, inspirational, charismatic leader. People have been working for uh, OpenAI because they shared his vision and where he was taking the, and the company. I think the fact that so many of them want to move tells you, you know, that they're more behind him than they're behind yeah. the company, per se. So, Mark, if he comes back, we don't know at this point. He could come back. He may not come back. I mean, does it change how AI in general is developed, what, what he does? Uh, it certainly changed the the sort of for profit arm of OpenAI, which was uh, we reported talking to investors about an eighty six billion dollar like valuation, one of the fastest growing startups. There are a lot of commercial interest in, in, from the VC side here that it seems there be signaling at least if, if Altman doesn't return 
that they're no, no longer willing to value that company at 86 billion. Um, and then so you have the resources, uh, you know, OpenAI has become the leader and effectively this, this new brand of generative AI as a commercial business, right? And, and clearly like Google, Anthropic, Cohere, um, there's a couple of European startups that, that so that, that market hasn't settled. Um, but there's just this this broad sense that they're going to be emerged like the sort of Amazon web web services, right? The the clear leader in this space. Now that's all thrown into question. Um, and then it's I think there's a really interesting question if you know if they all come to Microsoft, um, then if does that mean that Microsoft's going to be de developing a similar toolkit? Are they going to are their customers going to be wanting to the ones that were using OpenAI but not Microsoft? Are they going to still be willing to partner with Microsoft. There's a lot of open questions there. Yeah, so, I mean, Mark, essentially, I mean, the, the real question is actually how, you know, there, there doesn't seem to be first mover advantage if you have, you know, 50, 60, 100 people that are ready to move to, to another company. So could the real winner in AI, act, you know, in AI be someone else? It is strange to think 10 years ago to say the hottest startup in the world, their leader, and then like 700 of their employees want to go to Microsoft. So that speaks <laughs> volumes about how Microsoft has changed. Um, I do. I mean, they certainly still have an advantage in that they're kind of widely respected for having the, the best models and, and probably the most widely used. But Google's right on their heels. Um, and I, I mean, it, this, this does show, as, as particularly if they all move to Microsoft, that the gains from this current AI boom are really going to the in the Microsoft, the Googles, and NVIDIAs of the world. Yeah, Matt, how do you see it reshaping, actually, the, the AI landscape? Yeah, I mean, there are just so many different things that are reshaping the landscape anyway. And, True. you know, um, we've got so much going on in the open source world, too, that, you know, the kind of whole landscape of foundation models is evolving very quickly and all of the applications sit on top of that. So, you know, I think even if this change hadn't happened uh, or isn't, isn't evolving in front of us, I think 2024 is going to see a huge amount of changes in the landscape. Anyway, there's going to be uh, people that were, were leading that's going to fall behind. You know, you're probably going to get one or two other people come through that we've never heard of before uh, they're going to suddenly kind of land on a, a product and a, uh, or a platform that uh, that really captures the attention yeah. Matt we also have of course a US election next year but I think we have like 40 I mean more, over 40 countries going through elections mm -hmm. is it a real danger that AI basically spreads or, en or enhances you know the spread of fake news and, and how that gets managed in elections yeah, I mean, I think this must this be... This is the uh, question, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, yeah. we saw it in, um, allegedly, at least in previous election cycles, uh, and the technology has kind of moved on exponentially yeah. uh, since the, the, those last cycles. So, yeah, I mean, it must be uh, a, a huge worry for yeah. anybody involved in, in, in electioneering, really, in the next 12 months. I mean, I guess it's another big test for AI. Thank you both for joining us, Mark Bergen and Matt Bloxham from Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, coming up, Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey says UK rates may have to rise again. This comes ahead of the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt's autumn statement, where many are expecting announcements on tax cuts. Now, we'll bring you the latest next, and this is Bloomberg. feel a lot more positive about the UK economy than I did a year ago when I came in. And, um, you know, the biggest reason is because uh, we've managed to halve inflation. Well, that was Jeremy Hunt, the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, speaking at the CBI annual conference in London. Now, the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has said his government can begin to cut taxes after hitting his goals to have inflation by the end of the year. Now, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt will stand up in the House of Commons tomorrow with the details of his autumn statement. Our UK correspondent Lizzie Burden is here with the very latest. So, Lizzie, there's kind of talk about cuts. We don't know when they come in terms of tax cuts. Of course, they're also vying for, for this election, which will probably happen next year. So what clues have we had so far? Well, it was interesting to hear that speech from Rishi Sunak yesterday, politically significant, if not so high profile as you would expect for a speech that effectively reset his five priorities. So as you say, now that they've halved inflation, they're taking credit for that. It's not so much the Bank of England's job, which we might think it was. 
Uh, they say that it's time to turn attention to tax cuts, possibly even individual tax cuts, as one Treasury minister has been hinting on the airwaves this morning. Uh, that's been reflected by Jeremy Hunt, as you heard there. So laying the groundwork for the autumn statement tomorrow. But Bloomberg Economics Analysis says the margin to do that is wafer thin. So we'll have to see, as you suggest, which ones he can cut, whether it could be now. I was also listening yesterday at the CBI to the Shadow Business and Trade Secretary, Jonathan Reynolds. Four questions he was asked on tax cuts, including from me, and he dodged them all. So I reckon that this is the government trying to drive a wedge between itself and the opposition on taxes and really trying to reset this narrative, ditching the change narrative, which kind of was a flop at party conference. Hard to pull that off when you've had 14 years of Conservative government. It certainly is. And at the same time, we heard from the Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey, and he basically put, you know, everything on the table back. Uh, I mean, I guess he just wants to keep all options open. Yeah, we thought we were at the peak of Table Mountain, but perhaps not because of a potential spike in food price inflation. Uh, so it, we, the rate hikes may not be over, Andrew Bailey says. Uh, you're going to hear from him in about half an hour at the Treasury Select Committee in Parliament. be interesting to see how markets react because you have seen a rise in the pound off the back of those comments yesterday, but not a lot of movement in the rate bets. So it seems like markets had very much priced in his comments already. And let's be honest, these parliamentary hearings, more about the questions than the answers usually. They usually are. Lizzie, thank you so much. Lizzie Burden there, our UK correspondent. Now, Germany's finance ministry has imposed a spending freeze after a court ruled last week that a key part of its financing plans was unlawful. Almost all new spending authorizations for the year are now blocked, while the finance ministry assesses the ramifications of the ruling. Well, Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo joins me with the very late to say, Maria, first of all, what are the real implications of Germany's spending freeze? Uh, well, there's many implications, Francine, and I think this speaks again to the chaos, really the chaos uh, that this court ruling has thrown the German budget into for this year, potentially even uh, next, the fiscal policy and overall the coalition, uh, the German coalition, because this has implications, as I say, for the budget, but also politically uh, for everyone involved, to the chancellor, to the finance ministry, to uh, the economy ministry. Now, as I uh, said, and you alluded to this too, Francine, yesterday, uh, the German government put out a communication saying that they had halted and introduced a spending freeze for the rest of the year. Of course, this relates to that court uh, ruling last week, which said it was unlawful to rejiggle uh, debt that was earmarked for a project and place it uh, in another one. It also speaks to the many questions that the German government uh, has in terms of the medium term implications. They also mm -hmm. worry that that ruling, the, the thesis of it and the logic behind it could be applied to other areas of the budget. And then they may have uh, potentially millions of uh, well money that they would have to account for. Mm -hmm. And as it stands not accounted for and be applied retroactively. So yes, this is a big political headache to Germany, obviously for the funding. We already see the reaction, the German government trying to be very careful in terms of the funding that was projected for the rest of the year, but also looking at the implications for this year and then a message of a traffic lights uh, coalition. They remember, Francine, when they took office, they were very ambitious. They had all of these projects they said they wanted for a new Germany and now they could find themselves with their hands tied. So, meanwhile, France, uh, Maria, is also set to be put on the European Commission's budget watch list. So what does it mean for President Macron? Uh, indeed, and uh, this is an assessment that the European Commission will put out uh, today. They look at all of the individual countries, and of course this applies to the deficit and debt uh, trajectories for all of the countries. Obviously, if you follow the French macro, you will not be uh, surprised that the Commission says they want to see more efforts uh, for the country to bring it uh, in line and to see that structural decline in both uh, the debt and deficit ratios. Of course, for President Emmanuel Macron, remember when the pension reform uh, was approved, he said that this was a new impetus uh, for debt and also this idea of the time of whatever it costs that was brought about by the pandemic would be over. So politically, you could argue it is a setback to this idea of a government that said it was now serious about bringing down the debt pile. What I would say, however, is we have to treat this uh, with a pinch of salt because, of course, this is an early assessment. Everyone is waiting to see uh, the budget pro projects for next year. But also, Francine, remember, there is a very active uh, conversation about the fiscal rules, how they could be changed and could be re designed in many ways uh, for next year. That is an active conversation, and I think a lot of this uh, will not really matter until we figure out whether or not there is a deal for the new fiscal rules that would be instated from 2024.
Maria, thank you so much. As always, Maria Tadeo there in Brussels. Coming up, uh, stocks and bonds in China's property sector rallying today on the prospect of financing help from Beijing. So we'll have a full roundup of that story next. And this is Bloomberg. The conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is a Paul San Francisco Lacqua here in London. Now, a Bloomberg gauge of Chinese developer stocks is heading for its biggest gain since September, after Chinese authorities began drafting a list of 50 real estate firms that would be eligible for financing. Now, at the same time, China's central bank has also called on lenders to cap the amount of new loans given early next year and shift some to this year to help smooth the credit cycle. So for all of this, let's bring in Bloomberg's Sofia Orta Ecosta. Sofia, thank you always for making us a little bit smarter on what's going on in China, which is not always, um, I guess, that obvious to understand. So will the financing, you know, offered being overlaid, I mean, how, how does that allay concerns over the Chinese property market? Are they taking it seriously? It's, it's a really good question. And you're seeing already in the market, I mean, um, the, this gauge of property shares was up uh, more than 7% and it's kind of closing the day at half of those gains. So a little bit of skepticism already filtering through to the market. But this is an expansion uh, of already kind of a whitelist that uh, Beijing had of which property developers uh, banks should target and prioritize when it comes to financing. Before it was mainly the systemically important ones. And now it's actually much broader. It's a, f a list of 50 companies, both state backed and private. So there is kind of a more concerted effort to look at the property market broadly and support these, these funding efforts. But as always with China, skepticism always creeps in, Fran, because yeah. the question is yeah. whether there will be demand for it and whether it will actually work when sentiment is still very weak. Yeah, and so the idea is basically that they even out the lending, right? And I don't know how that, that's easy to do. Mm, so th that's the, with the credit cycle. So what essentially happened this year was that it was a very erratic credit cycle where you saw kind of a rush of lending at the beginning of the year, the first quarter, when the, we had those re relaxations uh, of loans. And then that got kind of dropped dried up throughout the rest of the year because of the concerns um, in, in the housing market. So what China is trying to do is smoothen that out so you don't have kind of a front-loaded credit cycle at the, in the first quarter of the year. And it's also trying to bring some of that forward, so kind of adding momentum to the credit cycle right now, asking banks to lend now rather than wait to the first quarter. There are questions over whether that will actually slow down uh, lending next year, but the, the good news is it, it does seem to show that there's increased momentum, increased urgency uh, to, to get the credit cycle going, Fran. So, I mean, overall, and there's something that caught my eye a couple of weeks ago, when you look at the foreign direct investment into the country, I think it was negative for the first yeah. time ever. Like, wh yeah. what's the kind of health of the economy right now? So what was interesting is before we were looking at portfolio flows, um, portfolio outflows, so that's kind of the fast money, not so sticky, very easy to pull out. Uh, and the idea is that it's also uh, can, can come back in quite quickly. And this is, uh, so FDI, when you kind of break down those numbers, some of the stickier investment is actually leaving. And that's a lot harder to come back to. A track of investment has been a really, really uh, big priority for President Xi Jinping and his government. Um, you know, a lot of the rhetoric uh, this year, especially in, in recent months has been about attracting foreigners and, and you're seeing you know Xi Jinping travel to to the US that, that that's uh, his first trip uh, to the US in a very long time yeah. so you are seeing kind of a more concerted push to attract investment again the question is whether that, that investment will want to come because you can roll out the red carpet all you want but um, you know you can't Money force to people flow. to come back in <laughs> yeah. absolutely true Sophia thank you so much as always Sophia Orta y Costa uh, there on the nuances on the Chinese economy now here's what else we're watching today just after 10 a.m. in London, the BOE Governor Andrew Bailey is due to testify to a UK Parliament's Treasury Committee. And then at 3 p.m. UK time, U.S. existing home sales for October. 4 p.m. ECB President Christine Lagarde also speaks at an event in Germany. And finally, 7 p.m., the big one, the FOMC minutes for September. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.